I'm standing on Mount Independence in Vermont, right on the edge of Vermont. Across the river there, behind me, is New York. And that fortification in the background there, that is Fort Ticonderoga. Very famous uh, fort, very key victory early on for the Americans. Uh, without Ticonderoga, of course, the Americans probably would not have won Boston. And that early victory, of course, made the rest of the, the revolution possible. That's behind me. There was a fort here, too, on this mountain. Uh, it was made of wood, and when the British retook it, just like they'd retake Ticonderoga briefly, uh, afterwards when they retreated, they burned it down. So there's, there's no uh, you know, Mount Independence fort anymore. It's just forest. But uh, Ticonderoga, made of stone, still around. This was a revolution that began in the Boston area. Massachusetts was the most sensitive of all of the colonies. Uh, you might say Virginia was as sensitive as Massachusetts, but Massachusetts was definitely a hot spot. And uh, it just so happened that even though the war is not going to break out until 1775 in Lexington and Concord, the shot heard around the world, uh, the first blood spilt, you could argue, in the American Revolution was spilled in the Boston area, and it was the blood of a 12-year-old boy named Christopher Snyder. Now, most Americans have not heard of Christopher Snyder, and yet uh, he was arguably the first martyr of the American Revolution. The only ones hated more than the British soldiers occupying Boston, and there were 4,000 of them, one in five Boston residents were soldiers, were British soldiers. So you can imagine the tension. Uh, the only ones hated more than the soldiers, though, were the customs officials. And they're, they're the ones who asked for the soldiers in the first place. The ones extracting money from the locals. So the customs officials, their informers, they had local informers. These were seen as the worst kind of traitor. And those merchants who refused to take part in the non-importation movement or the boycott of British goods. So these, these were hated even more than the soldiers. And it just so happens that young Christopher Snyder and another boy and some other schoolboys, uh, they sort of led a group of men uh, to uh, one of these merchants' houses. His name was Theophilus Lilly. Uh, they built an, sort of an effigy of, at this point, there were four merchants left that were holdouts. Everyone else was on board, but these four merchants, including Theophilus Lilly, were holding out. Uh, and Christopher Snyder and his friends built this effigy, uh, basically, you know, to burn in protest against Theophilus Lilly and his fellow merchants. Um, an informer, a customs informer, one of these hated informers, his name was Ebenezer Richardson. He comes out, destroys the effigy, uh, but the boys and the group follow him to his house. They begin pelting it with stones. He sticks his gun out the window and he fires into the crowd. And he injures one 12-year-old and he kills another. And that boy that was killed is Christopher Snyder, who, if you, if you go to Boston and visit the graves of the Boston Massacre victims, the Boston Massacre is going to take place two weeks later, um, you'll notice there's a sixth name underneath those five and that name is Christopher Snyder so now you know who he is uh, his funeral procession was two miles long you can imagine how uh, angry the Bostonians were keep in mind Boston's been occupied since 1768 it's 1770 so tension is very high you can't occupy a city whatever your motivations without eventually earning the bitterness of the local inhabitants. That's just a truism in history. Um, but in any case, two weeks later, uh, it's not a coincidence that a mob has gathered itself outside of the customs house, where the customs officials are basically barricaded, guarded by British soldiers. They're not just there uh, for sport, to throw snowballs, or to be petulant, as many textbooks portray them. They're there partly in anger, still stemming from Christopher Snyder's killing. Uh, they're there to protest against Ebenezer Richardson's uh, 
his uppers, his bosses, the customs officials. That's why they're there. Uh, in the end, five of them will, five of them will lay dead. Um, there is some speculation based on the angle of bullets that the customs officials themselves fired from the, the upper balcony, the, at least the upper floor of the customs house, and you know themselves were responsible for some or all of the killings. It wasn't just the British soldiers, but be that as it may, uh, blood had been shed. First Christopher Snyder's, then those involved in the Boston Massacre. This tragedy will eventually give birth to things like the Boston Tea Party three years later, uh, the Continental Congress a year after that, uh, Lexington and Concord, and the shot heard around the world there, uh, the flooding of uh, the area of Boston by farmers from New England and elsewhere with their guns ready to fight for their countries against Britain, uh, the very bloody Battle of Breed's Hill or Bunker Hill, which basically even though it's a loss for the Americans, demonstrates to the British that the Americans mean business. This is, this is going to be a real war. And uh, the capture of Fort Ticonderoga right here that I'm right next to uh, by the Americans, the capture of its artillery, which when placed on uh, you know, higher ground and pointed down at British ships in Boston Harbor is enough to convince the British to basically abandon Boston, which they do. Then you've got, uh, you know, the rest of the war in the north, which is mostly uh, focused on capturing New York, which never happens. Uh, there's the disastrous loss at Long Island, although a very successful retreat, maybe a lucky retreat. Um, there's the British attempt to cut New England off from the rest of the colonies. They've got that big force in New York. They send another force uh, under Burgoyne uh, right along this route actually. They're able to retake Ticonderoga, but then they lose at Saratoga. What a major loss that was. One of two times the British Army has surrendered to the Americans, enough to convince the French to get on board by the next year. And then you've got the, the war in the south, which is where it's really all decided. You've got a stalemate in the north at that point. You're not going to take New York. Uh, no matter what General Washington wants, that's just not going to happen. Uh, the south didn't start out very promising. Uh, you got the fall of Savannah, the fall of Charleston, uh, the absolute disaster at Camden where you had an American general basically uh, running away. I think, I think he, he rode for 200 miles and then got drunk in a bar. But uh, be that as it may, was not going well. But then Kings Mountain, Battle of the Calpins, these are all uh, uh, popularized in the famous movie, at least it was famous when I was a teenager, The Patriot with Mel Gibson. That, that's this period, this place. Um, and then finally, the surrender at Yorktown. Now the war didn't end for another couple years, but when it did end, the British made peace with, or at least the, the king, by treaty, made peace with all 13 colonies as states. So using the word state the way it should be used as a sovereign entity. Uh, the king did not make peace with one megastate called the United States. The king made peace with 13 separate states, confederated for the purposes of war. Christopher Snyder was the first martyr in this cause, but I think it's important to ask, what was the cause? Why did this war take place? Why were people fighting in this war? What was it all about? And you'll get all sorts of different answers in movies and popular culture and textbooks and from different scholars. Uh, I think at the end of the day, generally speaking, people were fighting for local self-government. They were fighting not to be ruled by a tyrant far away, uh, a strong central government far away, but to be ruled by their own local self-government. The Virginians were fighting for a free Virginia. Uh, those in Massachusetts were fighting for a sovereign Massachusetts. These were their countries. This is what they were fighting for. And the ironic thing is that it wouldn't take very long for just a few generations for this goal to sort of be lost. 
and replaced, perhaps, you don't have to agree with me, but replaced, perhaps, by another strong, even stronger, much stronger central government, and really the erasure of those states uh, and their being turned into basically provinces. I mean, who can argue that the states, the United States of America is made up of 50 provinces today. Congress is no longer a Congress. Congress means a meeting of ambassadors. That's how John Adams put it. That's what a Congress is. Look up what a Congress is in history. It's a meeting of ambassadors of separate states. That's what it was meant to be when it was first created. Um, now it's more like a parliament. It's interesting when you get down to the roots of what these people were fighting for, men and women, boys and girls, uh, time and time again I find that reason boils down to local self-government. Local self-government. Uh, what we might call decentralization today. Uh, ironic because today we live in a massive megastate called the United States with one highly centralized government in Washington. Uh, we still talk about the revolution. We emphasize certain freedom-related goals, but we don't emphasize local self-government, do we? We don't emphasize that as much. Is that why Christopher Snyder died? I don't know, you be the judge.